There we go. All right. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be together, that we can um, rejoice at the revelation of Jesus Christ um, to his people, to the church, and that you can encourage us to endure and to just keep following you. And that's what we've been learning, and that's what we're going to see today. Amen. Amen. And it turns out, yep, there's notes right there. And it turns out with all the notes combined, it's about 36 pages. And that's just an overview of Revelation. Um, so it's definitely something you can spend a lot of time with. Uh, having a, a good conversation today, again, with my, uh, my friend from Nepal, uh, who is encouraging and just um, made sure, like, don't forget about one point. So we'll make sure to cover that later today. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to chapter 20 of Revelation. Yeah, we're now, there's some giggling and, and thing in the front here because we know what's coming. This is exciting stuff. And I'm going to open to mine. And I'm using a New King James from the Holman it's Holman Bible Company, which is a, they're, they're a good group. They've got their own Bible. Um, it's very much like that, that style, New King James, nice and poetic and word for word. In chapter 20, verse one says, oh, Frank's still looking for it. And he has a very, he has a very new and hardly used Bible. So it's tough to get the pages separated. Yeah. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. So he wouldn't deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he was to be released for a little while. So we see that Satan gets chained up after Jesus comes for a thousand years. Yeah. So that a lot of people will call that the millennium because that's means a thousand years. And so that's, what's happening there. And Jesus is ruling at this point. Jesus is ruling. Um, again, this is uh, revelation chapter 20. And we're in verses one to four, talking about this thousand year reign of Jesus. Well, the cool part about it is the devil's locked up. So he can't deceive people. Doesn't mean the people still aren't going to struggle with being deceived. They can be self-deceived, right? And then it says, this is what that thousand year reign is like. And I saw thrones and them that sat on them. And judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not wished mercy of the beast or his image, or had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who takes part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they'll be priests to God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Yes, there's been persecution. People have died for Christ throughout this, what we've been reading, the revelation of Jesus. But at the same time, what a special reward to be with Jesus during that thousand years, to reign with him. Now, they died already. And they get to reign with Christ again. So that's because they're the ones that are going to be coming with him when he returns. And it's, it's not just the dead. It's specifically the martyrs who have died during this time. So um, that should bring us any comfort in case we do face that kind of persecution. Because then it's, it's like, yeah, okay, there, there is a reward for that. Which Jesus himself said um in the sermon on the mount he said if someone persecuting you for my name's sake you have a reward in heaven and this is this is one of those things pardon 
This is similar to it. Yeah, this is specific to the ones that were killed in Revelation during that difficult time. But there is always, if you're getting made fun of for Jesus, there's a reward for you. And so that's always to comfort us. Now, these people seem to still be on the earth when the thousand years expire. Because Satan is released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations who are on the four corners of the earth. So four corners means north, south, east, and west. And to Gog and Magog and gather them together, whose numbers as the sand of the sea, they went up under the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Then fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who had deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet already are, and they'll be tormented day and night forever. So this is, this, is, this is sometimes people get into this and they start to start analyzing all this. Uh, Gog and Magog are also mentioned in Ezekiel. And in some translations, it says that the ruler of Gog and Magog is the Prince of Rosh, which Americans think is Russia. It's just literally the phrase they use for their great commander is the Prince of Rosh. However, this does take place after the thousand years. So it is not the current Prince of Russia. Oh, that's, that's really important. I remember sharing that with someone who he handed me a book and it was, it was basically a, a Republican version of Christianity. So it was very American, very patriotic, very anti-Russia, very anti-Soviet Union. And he handed it to me and he said, what do you think? And I said, well, this is wrong to begin with because it's not the Prince of Russia because that happens after the thousand year reign of Jesus. That should help us want to minister to the Russians as well. But it can be easy to go through and see something that sounds like somebody's name. Imagine if there was something in there that sounded like Canada or Canada. All of a sudden, now we're the chosen people or, or maybe we're the bad guys. So it's very, we have to be very careful not to make our traditional political enemy and see them in prophecy. We have to be careful with that. Nowadays, there's two different groups of people that people will, opt, actually three, Muslims. Um, another one would be Chinese and Russian. All of these people need Jesus right now. They all need Jesus and they need people to witness to them. And Chinese, China has one of the, if not the largest growing church in the world. It's underground, but it's huge to the point where in some people have said that within the next number of years, I'll say 10, I don't know what it is. Statistics aren't always great, but they say that one out of every two Christians might be a Chinese Christian. That's awesome. But at the same time, it's really difficult really difficult for them and the same thing about russians you know russians they haven't had a lot they had a almost a hundred years where the bible was practically outlawed they need people and that's where we hear stories and that we have the books in the library of brother andrew who used to smuggle in bibles into places like that because they needed jesus too uh, and richard wormbrand another book that we have in the church library tortured for christ was tortured by the Soviets, but he loved them. And they would use children, and children would go up to the Soviet soldiers and hand them Bibles. Because who's going who's gonna to jail the child? So that was, that was a pretty awesome. So we just have to be careful we don't do that. And you can see that happening. We could even do that today saying, you know, which, which party is the most red party, like the Scarlet Beast, you know, the Scarlet Woman in the last one? Well, that's obviously the liberals, right? And, and so it doesn't mean that they're not being influenced by it, but what we need to do is pray for people and not read too much into it. What's really exciting is after the final confrontation comes, for all these beings, the devil is cast into the lake of fire with the prophet and the beast who are already there. And that is it. Now comes the final judgment. This is the one they call, this is the great white throne. So let's just read what it says. Great white throne. Great white throne. Oh, 
not the one that's in our houses. It's much bigger than our bathrooms. Because that used to be a joke in our house is, well, who's in the throne room now? But no, it's the great white throne. And then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose face, from whose face the whole heaven and earth fled away. There was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were open and another book was opened, which was, which is the book of life or just the one book that is about life. The dead were judged according to their works and by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up all the dead in it. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. Anyone not fit found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We have, we have two births. If you're a Christian, you have two births and one death because you're born and then you're born anew or you're born again by Jesus Christ. You're different from the inside out. And you can look back and go, wow, look what God has done. He's changed me. For some people, it's like instantaneous. Yeah, I'm totally different right now. Others, they look back and go, yeah, I can see how God is changing me. And so you're born again, you're born anew. Whereas if it's the other way, you're born once, but you die twice. Yeah. So that's both ways. It's, it's, Deb, you're totally right. Um, and it was, it's the place for, so it says death in Hades. So what is death in Hades? That's what's where people go right now. They go to the world of the dead. And Hades is the Greek word for that. So they just go to the world of the dead. And then there will be a final judgment. For those that are following Jesus, it says in other scriptures that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Which is exciting. Yeah. So this is that second death. Um, They're going to be with the Lord, and that's why they say they're going to heaven. But it's not the new heaven we're going to see in the next couple chapters. That's the spirit that goes there. We're going to get a new body, too. Yeah, the body disintegrates. The spirit goes up to be with the Lord. And the soul, because the spirit, we're a spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is connected to Jesus. Your soul is kind of... That's what becomes alive when you become born again. It's as if you had a part of you that didn't, wasn't alive. That would be your spirit. And suddenly now it's filled with God's presence and connects with God. Then we have a soul that is all of who we are. So our memories, um, our experiences, that's in there. And then we have our physical bodies, which break down. And the physical bodies, we will be getting new ones. So that's right. Everyone can say amen to that because everybody has something about their body. They don't appreciate this passage here that we just read about anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Yes. Everyone is being judged by what they did, but in the end, it is if your name is written in the book, which are, you'll still be judged. And I don't know what that judgment means, but it says for God to remember in John three seventeen and 18, it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, they might be saved. And the judgment is he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Unbelief towards Jesus Christ is the sin. That's the one. That's at the core of all other sins. That's what keeps you, more than just keep you out of heaven, it puts you in the lake of fire. 
And so that's why, that's why we preach Jesus. That's why we share him. And every situation, every time, time period has had certain sins that that's a horrible sin. That's a horrible sin. But all sin is horrible, but the most horrible sin is not believing in Jesus. It's kind of fun because this passages we're reading today are much more straightforward. There's not a lot of imagery we have to figure out. Chapter 21 begins with the rewards of the faithful. It says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Remember, they couldn't, the first heaven and first earth couldn't be in God's presence with the great white throne. It's like God, the father, just everything that's not perfect and pure just is obliterated. And here we have this new heaven and new earth that comes. There's no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. And there shall be no more pain for those former things will have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. He said to me, write these words for they are true and faithful. And he said to me, it's done. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give freely of the fountain of water of life to anyone who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be my God and he shall be my son. We're just going to pause right there. Wow. Praise God for those that are. That's the reward. We actually get to live with God. Remember before we saw all the singing and all the shouting, but there's more than that. God's prepared a new city and every city I've ever been in is busy. This one's going to be busy, but it won't have any CD parts. Sun would be just generalized. You know how we say the word you guys doesn't mean we're actually talking about guys. That would be the most likely. And also notice here it says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. We heard that at the beginning, didn't we? Here's the part where you can really see Revelation has these, at the very least, it has bookends. Otherwise, we were talking, we, I, I tend to think that it's pointing to a certain spot. Well, here now you're going to see the rewards, and it would be fun to go back. We're not going to do it tonight, but it would be fun to go back to the letters of the seven churches and see how many of these rewards are there. Be like, oh yeah, he talked to this about to that church and this church and that church. That he and it, it's just he will dwell with us. And that's our wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it? I would just today I was sitting in the church myself as I was praying, and I was like, Lord, let's have a coffee. Let's have a coffee and spend time together. But we'd be able to actually do that. Imagine being in a place that is just saturated with the Holy Spirit all the time. There's some parts of us that don't like that, but that's only the flesh that's not going to be there. So I, I wrote down in my notes, this is one of the most hopeful and exciting passages for the spirit-filled believer. And I didn't add any notes to that one to, one to seven, really, because you don't have to. He'll wipe away every tear. So every mistake we've made, he'll wipe away their tear. The old things are passed away. They're all disappeared. Specifically, he tells us what they are. No more death. No more sorrow. No more crying. No more pain. That's the old things are done. Well, we get all new mountains and rivers, too. But most of the mountains have already been flattened as we watched through some of these earthquakes that happened. And the earth is not going to look very good at the end of Revelation anyways. 
And it won't be because mankind polluted it or blew it up. So that scene from Planet of the Apes isn't going to happen. But then there's a list in, in verses 8 and 9 that's important to look at. These are the kind of people that aren't going to be in heaven. They just aren't. And it says, because in verse 7 it says, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. So we have a job to do. We got to connect with God. We overcome because he's in us and that he's leading us. And verse 8 says, but the cowardly, so those who would deny Jesus or live in, and live in fear, traitors, what's a traitors or those are, are like those who would turn on other, other brethren or turn on the faithful. Perverts, those who twist sexually and engage in all kinds of different illicit erotic encounters. That won't be there. Murderers, those who are hateful and show it by physically taking someone else's life or the, in the biblical sense, we could apply the same thing. You can, you can murder somebody's reputation and that won't be there either. Uh, the immoral, those people who just, they don't live with morals. They just live for the moment and throw caution to the wind and live for the moment. Those who practice magic. So we will not have superstition in heaven. Because superstition is like a light form of magic. You know, the actual rabbit's foot doesn't help you. Psychics and all that stuff, stuff, definitely not. Uh, There will not be any horoscope in heaven. Um, All those things. Idolaters. Now, that's one that there's a constant warning throughout the Bible. Do not have something that is another God or that you put your faith in other than Jesus Christ. That's all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. We are not to mix with that kind of stuff. And the last one is liars. There's no place for liars because we will always be surrounded by the truth himself, Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth and the life. And it also, the whole place is just going to be saturated with the Holy Spirit. So you just, and that, there's one point, one kind of this that sometimes it gets allowed in the church, and that is exaggerating. There won't be any exaggerating in heaven because we won't need to exaggerate because God is there. And some people do that, you know, they'll exaggerate. And, uh, you know, it happens a lot sometimes in um, well, how many people got saved? And they'll say, well, dozens of people got saved and it'll be 25 people. So technically it is dozens, but it's two dozens plus one. That would be exaggerating. That's not telling the full truth. And that's, and even still, do you know, they actually were saved from their sins? They might've said a prayer, but that doesn't mean that they're actually changed on the inside out. Just saying a prayer does not a Christian make. Ted, I see you've unmuted yourself. Is that because you had a a question or a comment? I, me, were you talking to me? Yep. Yes, I did have a question. Sorry. No problem. Uh, That's why I turned the post. Um, When it says there'll be no more sorrow and no more pain, is it Will it be God who removes the memories of those? Like to me, we won't even be able to remember pain or sorrow. When he says he'll remove it, I mean, I, I don't, I can't see there being pain and, and sorrow in heaven. But I'm thinking, will our minds be, you know, say, oh, you know, I, I should have told this person more about Christ and I didn't, and you know, that causes sorrow or, or pain. You know, people say, oh. You know, maybe if I spoke to him more, he'd be here with us now. I think that's where it combines with he'll wipe every tear away. Yeah. And I, I think say, that's, God will take it away. Yeah. I, I think when he's wiping the tears away, it's because of those missed opportunities and memories. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's where that would go with that. I don't know that he takes our memories fully away. Uh, it doesn't say that, but it does say he does wipe the tears away. So he takes the pain of the situation away. Yeah. 
And we'd probably get a really good picture of God's mercy at that moment. Cause he's still going to, we will still know his love. Even, even those, those times that we missed it. But you know, pastor, even now <clears throat> there are times when if you're walking with the Lord and I've, it's happened to me where, where if I'm in that place, say, say it's in the bush or at camp, I don't remember the pain in that. I'm just enjoying Christ. And, and it seems to be gone for that moment. And I'm wondering if that's what it'll be like in heaven. Will we just be so elated in, in worshiping and praising and, that it just won't, won't be there? Absolutely. I think that's a big part of it because he's right there. And he's not hiding anything. He's, he's in his glory. And God the Father is right there with him too. Just that alone, being able to connect and see God the Father. Um, that to me is awesome. Now we get to get into the description of the New Jerusalem. That's a great point, Ted. Appreciate that. This is the New Jerusalem, which is, it's good for someone that's an artist. And so one of the angels with the seven bowls comes up to John. And, and says to him, I want to show you, and I'm just, I've got a newer Bible too, because my papers, page is stuck together. Um, I want to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like the most precious stone, like a Jasper stone, clear as crystal. She had great and high wall and 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them were the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, three gates on each, each one of the directions, uh, east, north, south, and west. And on the wall of the city were 12 foundations. And on them was the name of the 12 apostles of the lamb. And he who had talked to me had a, a gold reed and measured the city, its gates and its walls. And the city's laid out like a square its length is as great as its breadth and its height is the same way. And it was 12,000 furlongs, which I believe is 1,400 kilometers cubed. Yeah, it says 1,400 miles. 1,400 miles cubed. Okay. That's probably more accurate. So when I've seen pictures of this, it's a cube that is roughly the size of North America as one city. It's, it's yeah. And it's taller than North America obviously, because it's, it's a cube, right? Um, although at the same point, you can see how some people twist things, because when if you've ever watched Star Trek The Next Generation, who are the bad guys? The Borg, what shape is their ship? A cube. It's a slight dig at Christianity, because Christianity is very, you know, it's almost like they're making fun of it, saying, oh, all of you will be assimilated into us. And there's a certain amount of, yeah, that's what Christianity has a certain <laughs> amount. So it's, it's quite, it's almost like a dig there. Um, but it's an awesome, beautiful cube. Um, the construction of the wall was like Jasper. The city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. And then he lists all the stones. Uh, the 12 gates, each gate is a gigantic pearl. And the streets were gold, so pure, it was like transparent glass. So all these things are pure. That's what I noticed when I was looking at it. All these things, these elements are pure. There's nothing impure about it. And they're all beautiful. Well, have you ever seen like a mixed stone or, or gold that is not refined as much as other gold? And at the same time, he sees no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it. For the glory of God illuminates it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations who are saved shall walk in its light. And the, the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor to it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day, and there will be no night. So it's this place of, I don't know what's on the outside, doesn't matter. 
because God's there. It'd be like going to church all the time with the food already being prepared at the church. Um, and all kinds of people are there. There's kings there. So it says that kings, kings are there. But at the same time, they're not kings anymore. They're giving their glory to God. All the nations. So every different kind of people group should be represented. That's why we, we support missionaries to reach people that the gospel hasn't been to yet. But there will be no way for anything that could defile it to come in or cause an abomination or even a lie. The only ones that can go in is the lambs, those that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's that book again. So when I was talking um, with my friend in Nepal, he was like, don't forget about the fact that there's a bride. This is God's bride. And he just put it very simply. He said, I want to sum it up. He's been studying this. He's basically working on his, his schooling, focusing on the theology of the bride. It's almost like the whole Bible is talking about Jesus getting his bride. Who is his bride? The church. So Winter just pointed out in verse 9, it says, the wife, the bride, the wife of the lamb. Because before it always says bride. Now it says wife and there is a difference between a bride and a wife they're married now so that's what god's doing here at the end so we are the bride of christ his people and god is not coming back for a dismembered or dirty bride he'll be cleaning us up he's cleaning up the church and that's what a lot of what he's doing he's cleaning up his church so that we actually look like something that resembles Jesus, like his bride. He's also, um, you can see in the Old Testament, that image is used a lot because Israel was not the pure bride. But there were people that were faithful to him that are included in it. And I say not dismembered because there will be no divisions among us. There will be no denominations. There won't be anyone that's like, well, I don't want to be a part of any of those Christians. Like, a thumb that's just not attached to any body because really you can't do that. That thumb is now dead and you can't use it. So God's coming back for this. So this is all exciting things. And so if I clammy for watching this shout out to you for that, uh, if not, um, it was still exciting because, and we actually got to experience that a little bit in December because as we were studying Advent, Gabe and Anna were getting ready for their, their wedding, right? And it's all about the bride. The only thing is it's a little reverse because in that culture, we're waiting for the groom. Whereas here, we're waiting for the arrival of the bride. Once we understand that, then a lot of things make sense in the Bible. We're not the, just like, you know, which way do we read? Left to right or right to left? Or which... Which side of the street do we drive on is the right way? Well, it depends on which country you're in. And now, um, as we see this vibrant city, it's not just, I want to be clear, New Jerusalem is imprint, immense beauty, purity, huge, and it's like a city unlike any city on earth. We don't just go into heaven. It's not about strumming harps on a cloud or just spending time with the dead saints. There's every city I've been in has a lot to do. This is the new heaven and new earth. And the center of it is this new Jerusalem. There's not even a sea there because you don't need to, because there's instead there's a river of life. You know, the river of life that's flowing out of me. We actually get to see the river of life. Although that's, we're a little ahead of ourselves. That's in chapter 21, 22. And that's funny because Again, I don't know that I will put the chapter break here because this, he's still talking about the city, right? He says, I see, showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne and from the end of the lamb. And in the middle of its, its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for healing of the nations. There will be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face 
and his name shall be on their foreheads and there shall be no night there. There shall be no need for a lamp or a light of a sun for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. So imagine you open a drawer, you don't need a flashlight because it's already light because God's there. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool to think about. Um, it reminds me of Colossians 3, 16 and 17, where it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, uh, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You know, as we, we do at church, singing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. And whatever we do in word or in deed, we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to the father through him. That's what it'll be like. Everything we will do will be, God will be there. At the same time, I also want to point out in verse, um, verse four, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Once again, we see that God marks his people. So we don't have to be concerned as much about the mark of the beast. We just need to continually be working on being his people. Then it's going to shift gears a little bit here. Then he said to me, and this is an angel says to him, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the, and of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must play, take place shortly. That's the same message we had at the very beginning of revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm, he's, this angel, Jesus said, I'm sending an angel to you, John, to reveal these things for my people so that they would know it. They would know me. So here we are. We're, we're coming full circle. And it must shortly take place and shortly could be in God's perspective. Remember, well, you guys, you guys weren't there at church at Lakeshore last week. But what I was preaching on was 2 Peter. And 2 Peter chapter 3 has this part where um, it mentions, you know, to the Lord, a thousand years and one day are basically the same thing. So when he says he's coming soon, we just have to trust him. says once again blessed is he who keeps the word of this prophecy of this book our job is to obey not necessarily figure it all out but just whatever we see here to obey to do it that's what the word keep means it's like if you're keeping the sheep you're watching over the sheep you're doing something i observe the law because observe is another word you might have in your translation Blessed is he who observes the words of this prophecy. It's not just looking. When I observe the law, I'm doing what the law says. If I'm not observing the law, well, that's when you get the lights coming behind you in the traffic, if you're not observing the traffic law. It says, now John, I, John, saw and heard these things. When I heard, I saw, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. And he said, don't seal the words in the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And that word holy, by the way, means set apart. Like, the it's really fun when you look in the temple in the tabernacle they had holy curtains they were set apart they were only for god's use they had holy curtain rings what's so special about a curtain rod ring nothing but it was for god's tabernacle they had holy forks and spoons because it was set aside for the temple and that's what we are we're set aside for him and that we are to still continue and carry on. Verse 12 says, And behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. That's exciting. 
for those that are doing the right thing. Not exciting for those that aren't. I am the alpha and the beginning, or alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He's repeating it for us. We should get that part. This is like the fourth or fifth time we've seen this in Revelation. Blessed is he who does those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter to, through the gates into the city. We started in the book of Genesis, there's a garden with a tree of life. At the end, there's still a tree of life, but there's now a city. How many people can you fit in a city compared to one garden? That's cool. That's exciting if we just stop to think about that. But outside are dogs and sorcerers, sexually immoral and murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. The biggest lie is I can do things on my own. I don't need God. That was the biggest lie that people fell for. At the very beginning, that I can do it on my own. I can be a God. That's Adam and Eve. I, Jesus, sent my angel to testify you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of, De of uh, David, the bright and morning star. So Jesus is the morning star. Which means if you think about the morning star, when you see the morning star, there's still a few, hour there's still a few hours of darkness. And then there's daylight. All that we're seeing right now on earth is the bright and morning star. That's how much different it's going to be. Frank has to see it every morning. I'm sure that um, some, quite often Ted and Ann do. I very seldom get to see the morning star. That's just, I don't see it when I get up. I, I'm doing better. I'm getting her up earlier. But yeah, it's, it's amazing to see. And I love watching the, how a day, when I used to work midnights, I love watching the brightness. You know, you go outside and you think, oh, it's so bright. And then all of a sudden you see the morning star and you're like, oh, it's getting close now. And then when the sun finally comes up, you can barely, barely open your eyes. So here we go. It says, I, Jesus, sent my angel. I am the root of offspring of David. So he's both the root and the offspring. That's only Jesus. We read about that when we did the Hebrew study for those that were involved in the Thursday night Hebrew study. It talks about Jesus is both the root and the offspring. Jesus himself says that. He's, he's like, the last question is his. Remember, they question Jesus about all kinds of things, and he always has the answer. Well, finally, he turns back and questions them, and he says, how is it that David, when he was prophesying, wrote, and the Lord said to my Lord, and, you know, I'll put everything under your feet. And he says, how would David, how could he call one of his offspring Lord? And nobody asked him any questions after that point until his actual trial. And even then he had to make the answer so clear that they would crucify him. And the spirit and the bride say, come, let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts and whoever desires, let him take water of life freely. So the Holy Spirit's excited for this too. The spirit and the bride should be saying, yes, Jesus, come, come. Even though we saw there's all kinds of difficulty for him to get here because there's all the tribulation that people have seen. There's all this difficulty, but it's still worth it. And there again, you see that, that word bride. The church should be saying, we want Jesus to come. Not like what the Pharisees did. When the Messiah came, the Pharisees are like, well, we're going to lose our political position. We're going to lose our importance. So they killed him. The church should be, yes, come. We want you to be here. Then there's a, a final warning in the book. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. 
If anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take them away in his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. And I consider that an extremely serious warning. That's why as we've been going through this, we've really tried to stay away from making it from our point of view. That's why I like to look at it from the original people. What did it mean to the people it was written to? Because I don't want to add anything to it. I don't want to look just based on my surroundings and go, well, obviously it's talking about thermonuclear war. That's just, I'm just making it up. But obviously it's talking about something I'm seeing in my day and time. I don't want to be adding to it. Because it says that he'll add the plagues that are in this book on top of it. And I've read the whole thing by now. So I know that I don't want those. The same thing is don't take away from it. Just read it. Even if you don't understand it, just read it. And where you see something to obey, do it. Rather than try and figure it all out. So that I, it's also... Notice it's one of the last things written in the whole Bible. And I know people that apply this scripture to the whole Bible, and I think you can, but it is specific to Revelation. So, because I know people quote this verse when they're talking, don't add to the Bible. And I think that's right, but specifically, we know it's talking about Revelation, because he says about this prophecy. That's why I, I tend to be on the more cautious side when I'm, when I'm looking at these things. I don't want to be looking at it backwards from my point of view now, looking back and telling God how this fits my plan. I'd rather be the other way. But at the same time, now there's a final encouragement. He who testifies of these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Which is like, that's like one of the theme verses for the entire New Testament. How, I, I don't know how many books of the New Testament end with that. But most of the letters do. They end with, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Plural, with you all. Amen. So that's how they, they close Catholic services was this here. And it's important for us to understand what that word grace is because it loses meaning. Because I could think of may the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all and think of the word graceful. So it's how I walk and how I move and like a, like a graceful um, gymnast or something. It's not talking about that. It's the word grace is the word charis most often. We would get the word charismatic from that. It's power. It's the power of Jesus Christ living through us so we resemble him. That's what grace is. It's not just a hug because you sinned and now you get grace. Now it's the power of Christ moving through us constantly changing us, constantly making us more like him. Okay. So Deb was sharing that, you know, in some cases people have had to die for their faith. We can think of the, um, I think it was Columbine in the States where there was the girl there and the guy held a gun to her set, head and said, do you believe in God? She had a choice and she said, yes. And he pulled the trigger. That's the grace of God for being a witness. In that, did she ever plan that? Not necessarily. She knew in her diary that God had a purpose for her. And there is a book out based on her diary. But the truth is, we, we don't need to plan for that. In fact, on Sunday, we're talking about that a little bit. We don't need to plan for that. God will give us the Holy Spirit. will give us exactly what we need in that moment to have the grace, if that's what we're facing, to die for our faith. And where we, we live, we have to have a different grace. We need a specific grace to live in Canada. We need God's power to live for him in a society where everything is pretty much provided for. It's really, it's much more difficult for us in some ways than those that are suffering and getting thrown in jail for Christianity. 
because people just ignore us here. People ignore Christianity or, you know, maybe belittle it a bit, but it's harder if we're just being ignored. We need God's grace. We need his power to reach people where religion doesn't mean anything to anyone. We need God's power for that because there's no other way that we can reach people without him. And part of that is God is teaching us to, you know what? How about you explain what church is? And that's what I'm praying. When I pray for people in the church now, and I'm praying for the disciples that are following Jesus and the laborers, I'm praying that they'll be able to explain it clearly so it can be understood. Because that's the grace we need right now. We need everyone in our church to be able to explain to the ones around them clearly. And if I'm praying for that, you know, I, God's answering our prayers. And I'm hearing fun stories from people that are like, you know what I got to do the other day? It didn't make sense to me, but this is how I shared it. So this is that. It's exciting to see here. Jesus encourages us that he's coming soon. To him, it's all soon. But we should still be looking forward to his return. Just like we talked about during Advent. You know, there's a second Advent, a second coming. We should be excited for that. Should help motivate us a little bit to live good lives. That's what it also says in 2 Peter. It's like, if you know Jesus is coming back, what kind of a life should you live? One that is aiming for purity, holy, um, set apart. I mean, sometimes we have to say no to things and yes to others. So there's some things that we do. We give, we're generous, whereas others might not be. Um, there's other things that we choose not to do. And some of those are specific. Um, you know, like, then there's lots of different areas where God speaks to a specific individual and says, I want you to give this up or give that up. It could be a TV show. It could like, or a movie in my case, it could be a special food, a drink. Um, so we've made it through the book of revelation. And the idea was part of this is to give us a fun study and something to, to chat about a way to learn how to read the Bible as well. So we've had lots of different, you know, encouragements on that. And I've been able to connect with lots of other past, like a couple other pastors on this who have really helped me understand it better. And as well, it was to bring us all the way to spring. You know, that last part of winter, February into March, and it's, you need something to keep yourself occupied. Praise God, it's spring now. And we know it outside. So our winter Bible study project is, is wrapping up right now. Um, now we still are, on Fridays, there's still the ongoing Vimy Ridge series, uh, which has been fun for me to, there's been two, there's two Vimy Ridge one videos out, uh, and it'll be a, and it's a 12 part series. So it's there, it's ready. Yeah. On the YouTube. Yes. So the YouTube channel will have that. This will still be on the YouTube channel. If you want to go back and review. And you might, I've, I might go back and review and go, oh, I don't know about that part. That's okay. We all make mistakes. The only time we'll understand it completely is when we're looking backwards and go, wow, God, look what you did. So I'm just going to pray. And Lord, as we, we thank you that we saw you through the book of Revelation. It was a revelation of Jesus Christ. And it was a revelation of how we are to serve you as we're waiting. And that you've got things under control. And it, yes, there's difficulty. And yes, people will be dying for their faith. But you reward them. You are the one. We just want to serve you. But when we do, there is going to be a reward. So I thank you for your reminder that you will reward us as we remain faithful to you, as we overcome the darkness around us. You're going to reward us. And that you mark your people. I pray that you'd help us to share what we've learned and how to read your Bible and how to listen to you and that you'll help us all to communicate the good news of Jesus Christ clearly so it can be understood for those that, that don't know you. Maybe they've been going to church for years, but they don't know you. But help us to explain to them so it can be understood and we can see you change their lives. 
Thanks, Lord, for this opportunity. Bless everyone who's been a part of this, whether they're here or around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for joining, everyone. Good night, Pastor. Thank you. All right. God bless.